I invite you to have a seat and to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 24 is our text today. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 326 and you will find 2 Samuel 24 there. 326 is the page because uh, I'm pretty sure 2 Samuel isn't the, the most common book that you read in the Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then feel free to take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, uh, a couple of things real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, just I just want to say thanks for being a church that is so generous and kind and compassionate. And I'm just rejoicing that I get to lead Calvary because uh, uh, of the way you guys responded to the children of compassion. So thank you for that. And then secondly, uh, first of the year, we're kicking off a new series called Freeway. It's kind of an unconventional guide to freedom. And, uh, and we're going to want everybody to participate, not just by coming to church, but by being in life groups. And so we're going to be inviting you in a few weeks to sign up for those life groups. And, and here's the thing. If there's more people in life groups, we need more leaders for life groups. And, and we need some people who are, will commit to be life group leaders for the seven weeks of the series. You know, and, and there's a lot of you that are eminently qualified. Maybe you've led life groups before here or someplace else. Or maybe you just kind of go, hey, I like people and I love God. Uh, I'll host or lead a life group. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, uh, this week, could you email lifegroups at calvarylhc.com and, and just say, hey, I, I'm interested in being a life group leader for Freeway. And uh, Mike Wilkinson, our life group pastor, will contact you and talk to you about what that looks like. And, uh, and we would love to allow you to be a blessing to other people in that because we're looking forward to this. Because I love the opportunities for life change. Hey, we are wrapping up our series called Money Talks. And uh, at Calvary, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And uh, the Bible is history. The Bible is poetry. It's letters. It's prayers. It's prophecy. It's stories of, of people that are incredible and how God worked in their life and how God revealed himself to them and how God reveals himself to us. And, and so we learn from looking at these stories. But some of these stories are wild. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are a little bit confusing even. And today is one such account. So let me begin by telling you the story. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Samuel 24 bits and pieces, but the story is this. Uh, it's King David's last chapter in his life. And if you're not familiar with King David, he was the greatest king of Israel. Uh, he, he was the guy that uh, was, uh, you know, as a, as a kid was the giant killer that became the hero of the nation because he killed Goliath. He, he grew up into the man who was the king, and he expanded the kingdom of Israel larger than it ever has been. He uh, conquered the city of Jerusalem and established that as the capital of Israel over 950 years before Jesus. He was the man. He was the man that was called the, the man after God's own heart. He wrote about half the Psalms that are in your Bible. He was also the man who's known for, you know, committing adultery with this lady named Bathsheba. And then when she got pregnant, he had her husband killed in battle. Of course, he repented from that. He was restored to that. But, but out of that, part of the judgment was uh, his son staged a palace coup and tried to kill him. David ended up running for a season, uh, trying to escape his son. And then when his son died in battle, uh, he was restored to the kingdom. And here he is at the end of the, the years. He's older He's successful, he's comfortable, and he's probably a little bit proud. And he decides that he's going to take a census of the people of Israel. He wants to know, how great a king am I? Well, that brings us to the first kind of crazy thing in the story. Look at verse 1 of chapter 24. It said, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, go number Israel and Judah. Uh, now, that sounds crazy because it sounds like God's telling David to do something that's wrong. And we'll talk about why a census is wrong in a little bit uh, for them in their context. But uh, how do we understand this whole God incited David to do this? Well, first of all, God kind of sees our hearts. 
He kind of knows what we're thinking. And there's David, who is a man after God's own heart, who God has been with him every step of the way. And David is proud in that moment. And he's looking at his kingdom saying, I'm a great king. And God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so God tested David. We know that God tests us because he wants us to succeed, not to fail, but he tests us nonetheless. The Apostle James writes, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, uh, there's these tests, and God wants us to pass them, but sometimes we fail them. And I think God tested David because he saw his heart, he understood his pride, and he said, why don't you take a census, uh, big shot king? And David went, yeah, I'm going to take a census. I'm going to count the people. Now, why is uh, counting the people such a big deal? Why is that such a terrible thing? I mean, we do a census every 10 years, uh, and so we know how many people there are and all this kind of stuff. Well, uh, a census is forbidden by God. Exodus chapter 30, he tells them not to count the people. Why? Because the people are the people of God. They're the Israelites. They're the chosen people of God. They belong to God. And in that culture, in that custom, if you counted it, you owned it. So what is David saying? I'm going to count my people, not God's people. By the way, in Exodus 30, there's a provision. If you're going to take a census, then each person pays a tax. And the tax doesn't go to the king. The tax goes to the tabernacle. It goes to the house of God to redeem the lives of the people that you're counting. To say, God, I'm counting them, but they really belong to you. David didn't do that. He said, go count the people. Don't worry about the tax. Now, his commander, Joab, who'd been with David for decades, he'd been the, his general, he'd fought for him, he'd fought with him. He said, David, don't do this. It doesn't matter how many men you have. It doesn't matter because God will fight for you. He'll multiply your army. Don't count them. Don't do this evil. David said, shut up and count the people. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the word of the king prevailed. If you're a king, what do you say? Shut up and count the people. So Joab did what the king told him to, and he went and counted the people. And, and David deliberately disobeyed God. And he continues his rebellious behavior for nine months. Because that's how long it took them to count the people. You know how many men there were? 1.3 million men. There, big shot king, you got 1.3 million men. Are you happy? No, because as soon as the count was done, David repented. Verse 10. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. He asked God to forgive him for the sin that he had committed. And God, of course, forgives him, but then God sends the prophet Gad to him with a choice. He says, David, here's what God uh, is going to do. He's going to honor your request, take away your iniquity, but there's, there's consequences for your actions. So you can choose which one of these judgments is going to be visited upon you and your nation. Three years of famine, three months of being pursued by your enemies, or three days of pestilence on the land. David says, I'm not going to fall into the hands of men again, so let's do the pestilence thing. And in the next three days, 70,000 people died. 70,000 people died because of David's disobedience. And again, David repents. Verse 17, as the death angel, because that's how the pestilence was delivered, is coming toward Jerusalem, David sees him, and, and here's what he says. Verse 17, David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand be against me and my father's house. He begins to plead, saying, I'm the guilty party. Don't punish them, punish me. So the prophet shows up again and says, David, go out and meet the angel of death. And there, where the angel has stopped, then I want you to build an altar. And I want you to sacrifice to God. In other words, demonstrate your submission. Demonstrate your repentance. Demonstrate that, that you know that God is the one who really is in charge and not you. And so David goes out to meet the angel of death. 
And he approaches this place, and it's at the threshing floor of a guy named Arauna. And Arauna shows up, and he and his boys are scared. I think we'd all be scared, right? And, and David sees the angel of death. I told you this was kind of a weird story, right? It's kind of like American Horror Story meets Stranger Things. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's weird. And, and David's there, and Arauna says, hey, look, take the ox, take the wood, take the, the, the threshing floor. You can have it. I don't know if he's being incredibly patriotic or self-preserving, but either way, uh, David says no. David says, I can't take this. I have to pay for it. Uh, pick up verse 24. But the king said to Araunah, No, I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Uh, that's an interesting and strange story. What in the world can we learn from it? First of all, this is a story of disobedience and repentance. David, who's a man after God's own heart, who loved God, rebelled for a season. Well, we know it was nine months for him. And there were consequences, real consequences, painful consequences that hurt a lot of people. David repented. Multiple times David repented, and yet he still suffered the consequences of his actions. This is a story of disobedience and repentance, and David's story is our story. David's story is your story and my story because our lives are, are so much like David's because we're sinners. We're inclined to rebellion. We disobey. We, we do what we want to do rather than what God says to do. Even if we're followers of Jesus Christ, even if we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and we believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and even if we've made a commitment to follow Christ with our lives, we still have that desire to rebel. We still have that urge to wander from God, to do our own thing. And so we rebel. Maybe for a season. Maybe for a moment. But we rebel. And then if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we come to a place of repentance. But we don't get to escape the consequences of our choices. We get to be redeemed, but... We don't get to escape. Now, David's story is our story. It's my story. It's your story. So here's the question. Where does your story meet David's story today? Because all of us are some point in the story. Maybe you're thinking about disobedience. I know, you're here in church. You're, you're good people. You, you love God. You've been praising Him. But maybe you and Satan have been having a conversation and there's something that's in your heart. There's something that you've been pondering. And you're thinking, I know it's wrong, but I want to do this. I know it's wrong. I know I shouldn't do it, but I really want to do it. And, and you keep telling yourself you're not going to do it, but you keep coming back to the same conversation. And you're thinking about counting the people. Okay, you're not thinking about counting people, but, you know, you've got to fill in the blank. You're thinking about disobedience. And, and, and Satan is luring you down this way. Maybe God's testing you and you're failing the test. So maybe you're here and you're thinking about disobedience. One that's going to have painful consequences. Or maybe you're here and you're just in the, the midst of rebellion. You're in that season of rebellion. You've already taken the action and you're unrepentant. You're going, why would you be in church if that was the case? Well, because maybe people don't know about it and you want to keep up appearances. Or maybe you're, you know, just, uh, you're going like, I know it's wrong, but I'm still, I still love God. I just am living in rebellion right now. Or maybe you're here and you've repented. You know, you're, you've, you've said, God, I'm sorry, and I want you to redeem my life. I want you to restore my life. But you're in the midst of the consequences. You're in the midst uh, of the pestilence. And the pain is real. And you're asking God to forgive your iniquities, and he's doing it, but you're suffering the consequences of your choices. Or maybe you're here, and, you know, you've repented, and God's restored and redeemed your life, and you're walking with God. Then celebrate that, but understand that you're about this far away from thinking about disobedience. See, where does your life meet this story of David's life? Because his life is a lesson for us. And in it we see that 
It's a story of disobedience and repentance. But we also see that leadership impacts everything. Leadership impacts everything. Uh, my favorite leadership author is John Maxwell. Uh, John Maxwell, uh, you read his books because he's really wise. Uh, former pastor, does a lot of leadership stuff. And, and he has a phrase that just stuck with me from the first time I heard it. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. David was the king. And so his sin impacted the entire nation. Okay, do you see that impact? He was the leader, he was the king, and when he messed up, 70,000 people paid for it. If you're the manager or the owner of a company, your actions impact your employees. Your actions impact your business. If you're a small business owner, you know, you know this. Your choices, your decisions have a direct correlation to that company. A pastor impacts an entire congregation, whether that's a congregation of thousands or hundreds or tens. Husbands impact their wives and wives their husbands. And parents, you impact your children. You see, leadership impacts everything. You cannot escape that truth. So I want to give you a, uh, just a, a mental image to take with you to, to remind you that your leadership impacts somebody. And uh, it's, a, it's an image that I kind of borrowed from another pastor, a guy named Perry Noble, who didn't heed his own advice, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, but I heard that, and it became a phrase that we as uh, staff use a lot and talking about uh, our actions and our consequences and our leadership. So I thought I'd share it with you. Some of you will love it. Some of you will hate it. Uh, but, uh, at, but I know that when I'm sharing it, but I think that the image will stick. So here it is. Because leadership impacts everything, don't poop in your pool. It's not quite as uh, profound as you were thinking, huh? Don't poop in your pool. Because what happens, if you go to a resort or someplace like that, it's got this great pool, and you want, I'm going to go out and lay out in the pool, I'm going to go get in the pool, and somebody poops in the pool, right? Some kid has an accident, somebody doesn't put on a swim diaper on their baby, uh, or maybe they blow out the diaper, I don't know. But suddenly, you know, the pool is contaminated, what does everybody have to do? Get out of the pool. And now they got to drain the pool, and they got to clean the pool, and, and they got to refill the pool. And if you wanted to use the pool or you were in the pool, your day is messed up. Okay? You no longer have the option to do what you want to do because somebody pooped in the pool. Don't poop in the pool. Look, I love being Pastor Calvary. It is such a joy. It's such a privilege. It's such an honor. So I guard my life from the big stupids. Okay, I do not want to poop in our pool. going to mess it up for everybody. Husbands and wives, moms and dads, please don't poop in your pool. Because generational sins are real. Uh, the second commandment, you know, Exodus 20, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. The second commandment is you shall not have any idols uh, don't make any graven images. Don't bow down to them and worship them because the Lord visits the sins of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation. And when I first read that, I thought, that's so totally unfair. These kids are innocent. Why is God visiting the sins of the parents on the kids? Until I grew up and I realized God doesn't visit sins. Parents teach them. Generational curses happen because we are teaching our kids we're leading our kids and leadership impacts everything and we are cursing them with behaviors that are destructive now the ten commandments were given over three thousand years ago research today validates that claim They've done all kinds of studies, and they've proven that there are certain behaviors that are passed down from parents to child, from generation to generation. So parents choose to bless, not to curse. And, and if you're caught up in one of these cycles, make sure that you're the one who breaks that cycle so you don't pass it down to the next generation. We're talking about things like alcoholism and addiction. Now, the statistics show that if your parents are alcoholics, you've got a much higher chance of being alcoholics. And they argue about whether it's learned behavior or it's genetics. It doesn't really matter. It's just true. My dad's father was a raging, abusive alcoholic. Just a drunk. My dad hated alcohol. We never had any in the house. I grew up thinking the 11th commandment was thou shalt not drink. 
My first crisis of faith was when I started reading the Bible for myself and I realized that God doesn't condemn consumption, just abuse of alcohol. But let me just be real honest. I don't touch it. I don't drink at all. Uh, and, and here's part of the reason why. I've got this genetic line of grandparents who are drunks. And I'm not going to play with fire. I'm not going to invite that into my family and into my life and potentially lose control because I have addictive personality traits. Have you guys heard me talk about ice cream? So I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to take that chance because my dad broke that generational curse and I don't want to invite it back into the family. Abuse is a generational curse. Whether that's verbal abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me, but people who are abused, you'd think they would hate it so much they would stay away from that behavior. No, statistically, they're much more likely to be abusers. That's a generational curse. Suicide is a generational curse. I know in a crowd this large, there's people in here who are struggling with depression and with suicidal thoughts. The enemy is in your head and he's telling you these lies about how you're worthless and, and how it's never going to get any better and there's no chance for God to redeem and, and that they would be better off without you in their lives. Don't listen to the lies of Satan. He hates you, he wants to destroy you. And if you're struggling with depression, then please get help. We want to help you. I mean, you know, uh, we've got prayer team people who love to pray for you. We've got pastors who love to visit with you. We've got counselors who will sit down and talk to you. We've got people who've started uh, survivor support groups for suicide uh, support, if you're thinking about it. We've got people who've tried and failed to commit suicide multiple times that would sit down and talk with you. In other words, we want to help you discover the fact that life is worth living and God can redeem your situation. But please don't believe the lie that, that they would be better off without you in their life. Here's why. Because if a parent commits suicide, their children are five times more likely to commit suicide. That's a curse. You do not need to pass on to your kids. And here's the thing. If, if you are been cursed in any of these ways, then, then understand that you can break the curse. You can repent. You can choose life. You can choose to live in the blessings of God. God can change your life. I mean, hey, that's what Calvary's based on. We want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So there is hope in the power of God to restore your life, to heal your life, to give you a future and a hope. But leadership impacts everything, and it impacts our children the most. So please, don't poop in your pool. And you don't want to do that because repentance is costly. Repentance is costly. David goes in the story from being a rebellious idiot to being honorable because he refuses to make a sacrifice to God that costs him nothing. Okay, 2 Samuel tells us he paid 50 shekels of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen and the implements. 1 Chronicles 21 and 22, which tell the same story, a little different flavor, uh, said that not only did David buy the stuff, but he bought the entire land that went with it. He paid 600 gold shekels for it, equivalent of about $600,000. He bought the entire place. Now, here's the really cool thing. You know what that place became? The Temple Mount. It became the Temple Mount. It became the place where David uh, wanted the temple to be built, where his son Solomon built the temple. The place where Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers. The place where sacrifices were made to honor God. See, God redeemed David's failure. But the price of that redemption was costly. It was costly for David and it was costly for God to redeem us from sin and death. Because it cost God the life of his one and only son. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was sacrificed to pay for your sins and my sins so that we could have life eternal, so that we could be delivered from death or from the death angel. So how do you respond to God's generosity toward you? Understand, grace is free. God offers forgiveness to us. We can't do anything to earn it. We can't buy it. We can't uh, serve to get it. 
We just have to say yes to Jesus. We just have to commit our lives to follow him. And, and that's how salvation comes to us. But when that salvation comes to you, how does that gratitude express itself in worship? How does that gratitude express itself in your sacrifices to God? In other words, is your repentance costly? Uh, really don't know how to frame this any other way, so maybe this will make sense to you. If you want to buy me a car, I'm all for it. I think that's pretty cool. If you want to give me a house, I will sing the praises of your name. You want to send me on a vacation? I'm absolutely cool with that. But if you want to pay my tithes and my offerings, no thank you. No thank you. That's not allowable, that's not desirable, that's not permissible because I want to meet my Jesus in worship. The Jesus who has forgiven my sins, who has promised me heaven, who has changed my life, who has allowed me to be called a son or a daughter of God. I want to meet him in worship and I want to give myself to him. I want to give him my talents, my time, my energy, my mind, my heart. I want to give him my resources. I want to say thank you to God. In a sense, by building an altar and saying, Jesus, here I am. I recognize you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I submit myself to you. And I need to do that, not just in word or just in deed, but with every part of me that exists. I need to lay it down for him. Because repentance is costly, and I am thankful for Jesus that he purchased me from hell. So repentance is costly. I want to close with a really hard question. And it's one that I hope that you will have a conversation with God about this week. Maybe it'll keep you up at night a little bit or, or you want to ponder it over your quiet time. Here it is. Are you giving God your best, your leftovers, or nothing? Honestly, are you giving God your best, your leftovers or nothing. Because our story is David's story. And money talks. Does yours say that you're repenting? Let's pray.